Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 2. Greetings, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. Open line Friday today, 877 877- 973-7425. If you want to be on the program, as always, text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 33777, and I will send you back a link to the show notes. I mean, anything and everything, you will want to follow me around social media and the like. Um, happy to do that. Um, okay. We've got to, well... Wow. <sighs> okay, never mind. Sorry. Um, I distracted by my, I was going to, well, I'll, I'll flog the show notes, but I put all my text in and I see that a certain someone changed all my text in graphics. It threw me off for a minute. All right. <laughs> Got to move on to the student loan case. I want to take your phone calls. 877-973-7425. Let me just read you from John Roberts's opinion. This is about, to keep in mind, the HEROES Act. Congress passed the HEROES Act uh, in 2003 to deal with military personnel and others uh, dealing with the fallout of 9-11 and the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And essentially... It allowed uh, the president to defer or waive student loan obligations up to $10,000 and and other things. And though Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and others, and Barack Obama, by the way, had said that the HEROES Act did not give them the authority to act uh, to unilaterally waive student loan or forgive student loan payments, Joe Biden ultimately tried to do that. Joe Biden tried to do that right before the midterm elections to persuade people to vote for him. And mostly, and this is important, it wasn't just conservative legal analysts. Most legal analysts said, no way, uh, you can't do that. But he did it anyway. And the Supreme Court has said no. There were two student loan cases at the United States Supreme Court today. One of those cases was thrown out based on standing, Department of Education versus Brown. It was a unanimous opinion by Sam Alito saying that the uh, litigator lacked standing. Nebraska, however, also filed suit and was found to have standing on behalf of its affected citizens. And here, this is what the Chief Justice writes, and this twists the knife. Wow, does it twist the knife. The sharp debates generated by the Secretary's extraordinary program stand in stark contrast to the unanimity with which Congress passed the HEROES Act. The dissent asks us to imagine asking the enacting Congress, can the Secretary use his powers to give borrowers more relief when an emergency has inflicted greater harm? The dissent can't believe the answer would be no. But imagine instead asking the enacting Congress a more pertinent question. Can the secretary use his powers to abolish $430 billion in student loans, completely canceling loan balances for 20 million borrowers as a pandemic winds down in the end? We can't believe the answer would be yes. Congress did not unanimously pass the HEROES Act with such power in mind. A decision of such magnitude and consequence on a matter of earnest and profound debate across the country must rest with Congress itself or an agency acting pursuant to a clear delegation from that representative body. As then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi explained, 
People think that the President of the United States has the power for debt forgiveness. He does not. He can't postpone. He can delay. He can postpone. He can delay, but he does not have that power. That has to be an act of Congress. Aside from reiterating its interpretation of the statute, the dissent offers little to rebut our conclusion that indicators from our previous major questions cases are present here. The dissent insists that student loans are in the secretary's wheelhouse, but in light of the sweeping and unprecedented impact of the secretary's loan forgiveness program, it would seem more accurate to describe the program as being in the wheelhouse of the House and Senate Committees on Appropriations. Rather than dispute the extent of that impact, the dissent chooses to mount a frontal assault on what it styles the court's made-up major questions doctrine. But its attempt to relitigate the West Virginia case is misplaced. As we explained in that case, while the major questions label may be relatively recent, it refers to an identifiable body of law that has developed over a series of significant cases spanning decades. At any rate, the issue now is not whether that case is correct. The question is whether that case is distinguishable from this one, and it is not. The secretary, for his part, acknowledges that West Virginia is law but he objects that its principles apply only in cases concerning agency actions involving the power to regulate, not the provision of government benefits. And he goes on from there and ultimately concludes this way. It has become a disturbing feature of some recent opinions to criticize the decisions which which they disagreed as going beyond the proper role of the judiciary. Today, we have concluded that an instrumentality created by Missouri, governed by Missouri, and answerable to Missouri is indeed part of Missouri, that the words waive or modify do not mean completely rewrite, and that our precedent, old and new, requires that Congress speak clearly before a department secretary can unilaterally alter large sections of the American economy. We have employed the traditional tools of judicial judi decision-making in doing so. Reasonable minds may disagree with our analysis, and in fact, at least three do. We do not mistake this plainly heartfelt disagreement for disparagement. It is important that the public not be misled either. Any such misperception would be harmful to this institution and our country. The judgment of the district court for the Eastern District of Missouri is reversed, and the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. The government's application to vacate the injunction against the student loan bailout is denied as moot. Not putting up with attacks on the court. I think John Roberts has had enough. Um, these attacks on Amy Coney Barrett, Sam Alito, Clarence Thomas, clearly taking a little bit of toll on John Roberts's temper with the left these days. Um, fascinating the way he ends this about uh, disagreement and disparagement of the court. Fascinating the way he would do this. Uh, good for him, though. So the student loan bailout goes away. Now, this is a problem for a lot of people, myself included. I've got student loans and will be bailing on them for the next 15 years, but this is the right decision. Congress never contemplated a president bailing out the student loans. And you know that because Joe Biden himself said the president does not have the power. Nancy Pelosi said the president does not have the power. Barack Obama said the president does not have that power. The only people who did were Elizabeth Warren and uh, AOC and the progressives around the president who thought it would be an electoral win for him in 2022. They gave him what he wanted. He did what he said he could not do. And the court has said, nope, you never should have done it beforehand. And the left can attack the Supreme Court all they want, but are they literally arguing the Congress gave the president unilateral power to eliminate over $400 billion of spending in the United States without congressional appropriation? That's, that's what they're arguing. And if he can do it here, any president can do anything like that in the future. And as, as is uh, relevant to the court, this wasn't done at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. This was done as it was wound down. As we were within months of the president saying the pandemic was over, he was doing this, which looked more like a political stunt than a lawful, legitimate act. Good for them. All right, the phones, 877-973-7425. Susan, you're up next. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. 
I'm going to the website designer and, and also related to the cake bakery a few years ago. Um, doesn't, I want to know if you think that not only does this, is this a free speech area, but doesn't it maybe spill over into the realm of forced labor? Uh, okay. Yes and no. However, <laughs> um, so what the court says uh, that, that, that this isn't a, a making someone work for someone else issue, which uh, is unconstitutional under the 13th Amendment, uh, the slavery amendment, prohibition on slavery amendment, that this isn't forcing her to work for someone. Uh, the court has said, in fact, that uh, you cannot discriminate uh, based on someone's sexuality in, in providing goods or services. So you, the secular business, have a, a gay person come in and they want to buy a widget from you. You can't say you're gay. I'm not buying you the widget. That is um, that, that is unconstitutional. What the court is saying, however, is that if a gay person comes to you and wants to buy the widget, but have you write on it, I hate Jesus, you do not have to write, I hate Jesus, on the widget. It's a matter of your speech conflicting with their speech. You can't deny them the good or service because they're gay, but you can not be compelled by that person to then add a message to it you disagree with. So in this case, there was no dispute by Colorado or by the courts that uh, Lori Smith, the web designer, she had gay clientele. She had people who were gay with whom she did business or at least was willing to do business with gay people. She just was not going to build a website for a same-sex wedding because she believes marriage is between a man and a woman. What the left is getting muddied here is they're saying that she was told she didn't have to work with gay people. That's not it at all. In fact, as the court repeatedly points out, she said she's willing to do business with gay people. She's just not willing to provide her, her services to promote a cause she does not support. So this was a purely a speech issue. It's not a labor issue. A labor issue under the 13th Amendment uh, would be different, and they won't treat a this as a forced labor issue because she was willing to provide work. She was. She said she's willing to provide the work. She's just not willing to provide the work and affirm a message that she doesn't agree with. All right, uh, back to the phones. Let's see. Yeah, I've got time for one more here. Joe, welcome to the show. Joe? Hello. Hi there. Hey, yeah, this is Joe from Atlanta. Welcome, Joe, from Atlanta. Yeah, this is my first time, and I thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. Okay, I had an opinion on the, um, the the subject from yesterday with the affirmative action at the uh, colleges. Yep. Yeah. Well, I had an opinion, and um, I'm a single um, dad, um, African American. But um, uh, when we were talking about uh, whether uh, discrimination against the Asian uh, in the colleges, and uh, that versus people saying that the African-American community had been discriminated against and you're saying, Hey, you can't do one and do the other. And I'm in partial agreement with that, but I had a a different opinion as far as that this problem started a a little bit earlier for the African-American community. And I think that they have a difference in opinion only because not because we have any type of Asian hate in there. It was just more of a, more of a line you know what I'm saying? Like, first come, first serve. Since while uh, blacks had been um, kind of beat up in the past a little bit, they were kind of looking for a little bit of this or that. I don't think we need to have all of the colleges necessarily to do anything. I think that the law should be passed in the government more so than taking it to the college and making them have to do any type of decision making on that. Yeah, look, uh, Joe, I appreciate the phone call and the comments, and and, and I do get that, um, that uh, black citizens in this country have an actual documented history, including a civil war of uh, not just discrimination, but actual forced slavery. Um, But also, the court says we've got to move beyond discrimination, and we got to move beyond racial discrimination. And the way you move beyond racial discrimination is to move beyond racial discrimination. You don't want people to discriminate against uh, black people. You don't want people to discriminate against anybody. So I understand the emotional uh, issue, but at the same time, the court says it's time to give up discriminating against people. And that includes discriminating against Asians in college applications. Now, some of you, though, say, well, they may try a backdoor based on what Robert said. Yes, but 
Let me explain that when we come back. Is everybody else taking off today or something? <laughs> I just, all these people text me, are you going to be live today? Are you live today? I realize next week is 4th of July, but I'll be with you the first hour on the 4th of July too. Um, I am going to take off uh, two Fridays in a row, like the, the or three Fridays in a row the, the in July, but I tend to actually work like five days a week, people. So I'll be off Monday and Tuesday next week, but I will be uh, with you for the first hour uh, on the 4th of July because somebody's got to be here with you on the 4th of July and, and actually tell you what it's all about. Now, the phone lines are open. It's an open line Friday. It is 877-973-7425. Uh, should you wish to be on the program, I got a short segment here, so stay on the phones and I will get to your phone calls when we come back. Let me answer this, though, because I've got this a lot. In John Roberts' opinion on affirmative action, he said colleges will be able to read essays of students and uh, analyze based on those how race individually impacted that individual person and how that individual person overcame their struggle. And a lot of people have seen that, one, because they just can't take the win, but also they're like, oh, the left are going to try to undermine them. Listen, uh, segregationists always try to undermine desegregation. Uh, the Democrats used to have Jim Crow. Now they have affirmative action. Uh, it's still the Democrats trying to undermine uh, a prohibition on discrimination. But it actually is harder than that. And the reason is because the Supreme Court has embraced a statistical model on discrimination. So, for example, if uh, the top Asian students are still being prohibited at Harvard and there is a statistical ratio of lesser qualified applicants still getting in the door, well, that's going to be de facto proof of discrimination. So Harvard's not going to be able to continue the regime of discrimination against Asians using essays now instead of uh, checking the box because the statistics will show that they're still discriminating and they will get slammed again by the court. They're going to try. You and I both know they're going to try. I just want you to understand it's not nearly as easy as you might think it could be because of the court's willingness to use statistics to show discrimination. Now, I want you to discriminate against stinky odors in your house, and you can with the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. In fact, my friend Pam, who is listening right now, told me she took my advice. They had a dead animal in the wall in their kitchen, and they brought in the Eden Pure Thunderstorm, fired it up, and it eliminated the dead animal smell. So not only does it eliminate smoke odors and litter box odors and pet odors and cooking odors, it eliminates dead animal in the wall odors, which I myself, having had a dead squirrel in the attic, can attest to the fact that it does. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm wipes out those noxious odors, and you can get three of them for less than $200. You go to EdenPureDeals.com. You put in Eric, E-R-I-C-K, on the front page of that website. You will get three of them for less than $200, one for your at the dead squirrel in the attic, one for the dead mouse in the basement, one for your Aunt Patty who came over smelling like cigarettes in the living room, wherever you need them, even your travel bag. EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is E-R-I-C-K. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877 877- Nine seven three seven four two five. We got a lot of people who want to talk about these Supreme Court cases, and I wish to allow it. Um, before I get there, though, I want to say something. Um, I know that there will be days when those of us on the right have bad days politically and have bad days before the Supreme Court. But this, the very last day of Pride Month, is not that day. Uh, we end Pride Month on a happy note. The Supreme Court, having sided with Lori Smith and 303 Creative, gotten rid of the student uh, debt bailout and ended affirmative action. This is the end of a very good month in June for conservatives. We always, it won't always be like that, but we should savor and enjoy the wins as the left always tries to rub our nose in losses. We came off of 2022 and those losses, and here the Supreme Court comes at the end with some big wins led by none other than John Roberts, which is a big deal. Now, to the phones we go, 877-973-7425. Steve, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Good, how are you? 
Doing good. Hey, I just had a, a comment I wanted to make. Uh, it it re- refers to uh, reparations and also the affirmative action that we've had for the last 50 years. And, you know, I keep hearing uh, the people on the left saying that there's been no reparations, we need reparations, but affirmative action, in my mind, uh, it was reparations. It was helping uh, black Americans and others who have been uh, discriminated against to get special treatment to help them get past all those uh, things that were done in the past. But now it's been 50 years, and I think it's the right decision to end that. Oh, you're, you're going to rub some people the wrong way with reparations. I, I'm not going to touch that one. I will just say, I mean, that has <laughs> been the Supreme Court's logic, Steve, over the last few years, Sandra Day O'Connor writing, uh, other justices writing, that there would come a day when affirmative action would end. And the Supreme Court, in the decision yesterday by John Roberts, says essentially it's time to end affirmative action when governments are allowed to pick and choose uh, which minorities to discriminate against and which minorities to not discriminate against, which is what it amounted to, is this was not about white people discriminating. It was not about discriminating against white people. It was about the government saying, well, this is a preferred minority and this one is not. And that's not the way to do it. As John Roberts has written repeatedly, the way to end discrimination is to end discrimination. And the way to stop discriminating is to stop discriminating which he made clear yesterday. 877-973-7425. Richard, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, Eric. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Hey, I, I just read the um, affirmative action decision last night and this morning. And mm-hmm. I thought it was a very, very good decision. I really liked John Roberts, what John Roberts had to say. I liked what uh, Clarence Thomas had to say, although it was very, very long, what uh, Clarence Thomas had to say. Um, my question for you is about the dissenting opinion, um, and it was written by, as you know, Sotomayor. It didn't seem like to me like it, it seemed very shallow. It seemed like she was writing from the perspective of a social justice warrior and not as a justice. And I just wanted to get your opinion on the dissent opinion and Justice Sotomayor overall. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on Katanji Brown-Jackson, but Sotomayor wrote the lead dissent. And it, you're right. She sounded more like a politician on a stump speech campaigning uh, for victims than she did a Supreme Court justice. It was an intellectually shallow case, particularly in light of the decision today where Sotomayor takes the 303 creative case and says it's all about discrimination. It's all about you you can't discriminate against people. But yesterday, she literally wrote a decision where discrimination is okay. It was it, it's a nutty, inconsistent opinion from Sonia Sotomayor, and it read more as an activist. It read more as uh, someone who was not serious about the issues but was trying to placate a side. It was, I mean, I, I really, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make light of it, but the, the Supreme Court justices are allowed to hire law clerks who can make them look good. I mean, one of the things today is uh, Sotomayor mentions the Matthew Shepard situation, which if you've read anything about the author who investigated it, it's not as uh, the public mythology would hold, but more particularly the Pulse nightclub was specifically not uh, anti-gay hate. It was ISIS responding, and he just happened to win, go to that nightclub, uh, and she used that as a as a sign of anti-gay hate, which isn't true. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson yesterday cited a study that said black women who have black doctors, their babies have a higher rate of survival. In fact, I I, I should I should spend a moment on this one because this one kind of is is really bad. When the Supreme Court heard the affirmative action cases, one of the amicus briefs cited a study. The study claimed that women who, black women who have black doctors have a higher rate of survival for their black children than black women who have white pediatricians. The study has been, uh, or that statement has been thoroughly debunked, including by the authors of the study. But 
Katanji Brown Jackson put that study in and cited it in her uh, dissenting opinion yesterday, which had she had competent law clerks should not have happened because literally the study does not state what she claimed and the authors of the study have rebuked the claims that were in the amicus brief. So what the study actually is, is of uh, babies survivability inside and outside of neonatal ICU units. It turns out that in neonatal ICU units or NIC units, there are more white doctors than black doctors. And NICU babies have a higher rate of death than babies that never have to go to NICU. Therefore, it is correlation that uh, babies with white pediatricians, including black babies, have a higher rate of death than those uh, who have black doctors. There are less black doctors in NICUs than white doctors. And so it's all correlation. It, it's not actually cause. Katanji Brown Jackson yesterday cited it as proof of, of uh, systemic racism and, and woven into society that black women who give birth to black children, those children tend to live longer if they have black doctors. That's not what the study shows. It's been thoroughly reputed by the studies on authors, and yet uh, it made it into her dissenting opinion that it was true when it's not. That's just really bad writing, really bad writing, and her law clerks could have protected her from that. In the same way, Sonia Sotomayor fails to even grapple with the fact that in the affirmative action case, she explicitly is in favor of discrimination against one minority in favor of another. And then in the 303 creative case, explicitly rejects discrimination at all ever. Uh, she can't reconcile those two. And, and the majority actually points out the hypocrisy of it, that she can't reconcile those two. It really was shoddy, shoddy work. Uh, and I, again, find it extremely notable that Elena Kagan never even bothered to write a dissenting opinion in the affirmative action case because she actually is a very smart person. Antonin Scalia recommended her for the Supreme Court. And I, I think the reality here is that um, she knows how weak the argument is for affirmative action, even though she, she supported it, so she just refused to even try to write on it. Now, back to the, the calls. Uh, Paul, you're going to be up next on the show. Welcome. Yes, hello, Mr. Eric Erickson. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Um, so my question was going to be on the 303 Creative case, and does that potentially have any relation to uh, Jack Phillips? Because I know his case was kind of in a similar vein against the Colorado Commission with the cake baking. So yes. I don't know if, uh, um, so... So Jack Phillips' case is working its way back to the United States Supreme Court. And based on the 303 creative case, his new case may be withdrawn altogether. So let me give you guys the history of Jack Phillips. Jack Phillips is a Christian baker in Colorado. And, and you really, you, you got to understand this one um, to understand just how willfully hostile to Christians the Alphabet Gang has become. Jack Phillips in Denver, Colorado, as a baker, there are 13 other bakeries within a mile radius of his bake shop. But Jack Phillips is explicitly Christian. Jack Phillips will not make cakes for Halloween because Jack Phillips believes Halloween is a pagan holiday. Jack Phillips will not make cakes for second marriages if the first one ended in divorce, if he knows about it. If you go in and ask him for a wedding cake, he's happy to do it. But if you let slip, it's for a second marriage. He's not going to make it for you if it was a divorce because he takes his faith seriously. And Jack Phillips will not bake cakes and design them for gay marriages. So a couple came to Jack Phillips and they asked him to make a cake for a same-sex wedding. Jack Phillips, to save people money so that they can have a nice cake, makes pre-made wedding cakes. And they're gorgeous. He is known as a cake artist. Jack Phillips told the couple that he's a Christian. He believes marriage is between a man and a woman. He won't even make a cake for a, a second marriage. So he's not going to make one for a gay marriage. But he's got these pre-made cakes. If they would like to take one of his cakes that are already made and decorated, and they themselves can put the same-sex wedding topper on top of it, he's fine with that. And they said no. They want him to put the same-sex wedding topper on it. And they filed a complaint with Colorado Civil Rights Commission. 
When it made it to the Supreme Court, even Elena Kagan sided with the majority because the Colorado Civil Rights Commission compared Jack Phillips to a Nazi. That's not hyperbole. They actually said Jack Phillips was engaged in Nazi-like behavior by refusing to bake a cake for a gay wedding. So the Supreme Court in that case ruled that uh, there was clear hostility to Jack Phillips. Uh, Therefore, there was no way for him to get a fair hearing, and they threw it out on those grounds, not on free speech grounds. On the day that the case came out, and it was a big victory for Jack Phillips, a transgender activist lawyer called Jack Phillips' shop and asked for a birthday cake, which they decided they would, which they said they would do. But then the transgender activist became more specific and wanted a blue cake that had pink icing because the lawyer's transgender and wanted to celebrate transgenderism. So they had agreed to make the birthday cake and then got the specifications for the cake from the transgender guy. And and, uh, they said, no, I'm sorry, we're we're not going to do this. We don't believe in transgenderism. So the transgender activist then filed suit. That case is now making its way back towards the Supreme Court. The 303 creative case would suggest that, uh, no, this is unconstitutional action because Jack Phillips would make a cake for gay clientele and, in fact, has gay clientele. But he does not want to make a cake to celebrate something he does not agree with, so he's not going to make a cake to celebrate a gender transition, which he doesn't agree with. Based on 303 Creative, I think Jack Phillips' case is already resolved, and, in fact, I think the Court of Appeals will now side when it gets into federal court, which it will. I think they're going to have to side with Jack Phillips. This case kind of makes it clear there. you you got to stop forcing people to use their skills to advocate for causes they disagree with, which is what they've continued to try to do to Jack Phillips. The Alphabet Gang activist community in Colorado has been relentlessly targeting Christians, and the Supreme Court just shut them down. They shut them down with the help of Americans for Prosperity, Alliance Defending Freedom, and other great groups. Americans for Prosperity is a real advocate of uh, free markets and free people, of limited government, of protecting people from forced government speech. They want you on their side, and you can be by going to americansforprosperity.org slash E-R-I-C-K, americansforprosperity.org slash Eric, my name. They've got 36 state chapters. They're organizing in the other states. They have 4 million people across the country who work with AFP. You can learn how to do door knocking to advocate for free markets and free people, to educate voters, and also find out what voters are thinking on issues. You will learn how to be a more effective activist at your local school board, at your local city council, uh, how to reach out to your state legislators to persuade them that limited government, free markets, and free people are great ideas. They turn you into a great activist. Reach out to them, americansforprosperity.org slash Eric, americansforprosperity.org slash E-R-I-C-K. Become a more effective advocate for free markets and free people with Americans for Prosperity. I got to tell you guys, watching the left melt down over this really is uh, just extremely, I mean, it's shocking to be lectured by these people about authoritarianism, to be lectured by these people about how undermining the rule of law and institutions is bad, and that's all they are doing today to the Supreme Court. You cannot believe them when they say they're concerned about authoritarianism. You cannot believe them when they say they're concerned about the rule of law. You cannot believe them when they say they're concerned about undermining institutions in America because that's exactly what they are doing today with the Supreme Court. Uh, Joe Biden is attacking them for the student loan decision when he himself in 2021 said, quote, I don't think I have the authority to do it by signing with a pen on student loans. That, That was Joe Biden in 2021 before he did it. Pete Buttigieg today tweeting out, discrimination is wrong. Using religion as an excuse to discriminate is wrong and unconstitutional. The court's minority is right. The Constitution is no license for a business to discriminate. Today's ruling will move America backwards. That's not how they ruled. They said you can't discriminate, but you also can't be compelled to speak. By the way, you you know, there's, there's a side angle here. What people are missing as a side angle on the 303 creative case is uh, the state of California 
the state of Minnesota and several others are advancing legislation that would require individuals to use uh, the preferred pronouns of the mentally ill. And if you don't, you can be punished by the state for hate speech, among other things, for hate crimes, for harassment, if you don't use the preferred pronouns of the mentally ill. This 303 creative case destroys those laws. I mean, uh, the Supreme Court is pro-abortion when it comes today to, to these sorts of issues. They are smothering uh, the, the fetal remains of these leg- legislative proposals that are pending in legislatures. They do not uh, pass constitutional muster after 303 creative. 303 Creative is very clear that when it comes to free speech, the state cannot force someone to take a position to tell someone you must refer to a woman as a man or to refer to a man as a woman is flat out unconstitutional. The state cannot do that to you. And by the way, if your private business deals with the federal government, they won't be allowed to do it either. You know some businesses are headed in this direction with their diversity, equity, and inclusion offices where they they expect you to use the preferred pronoun of the mentally ill person down the, the, the hall from you. This is They're not going to be able to do it. 303 Creative shuts this down before it even begins, which is a good thing. Celebrate and save at Ashley's Anniversary Sale with Hot Buys, your choice of color starting at just $3.99. Ashley Sleep Mattresses starting at $250. Plus receive a free adjustable base with select mattress purchases. And shop top mattress brands like Stearns & Foster, Tempur-Pedic, Purple, and Beautyrest Black with special financing options for every budget. Only at Ashley in North Charleston and Mount Pleasant. Subject to credit approval. No minimum purchase required. Minimum monthly payment, down payment, tax, and delivery may be required. See store for details.